know that when the Wano arc first began, the newest Apple phone was the iPhone X, Donald Trump was still the President of the United States, and COVID… well COVID didn't even exist yet. And to contextualize this for the world of anime and manga, Hunter x Hunter fans were still receiving some chapters every year, both Demon Slayer and Jujutsu Kaisen had not made their entry into the anime world, and this very channel had not yet been conceived. In fact, neither were you. Okay, maybe not that last part, but you guys know where I'm going. My point is that Wano has been an extremely long arc. And don't get me wrong, because Wano has also been an extremely enjoyable arc. You know, packed with awesome action, lore, and personally, the reason why I loved it so much. The fact that we got to see all the Straw Hats together again after years of seeing the crew separated. But now it seems like a lot of fans are eager to pack it up and move move on. And while I do think that there are still some things left unresolved that we are going to have to see play out at Wano, a part of me is also very excited to see what new adventure awaits the crew. Which is why today we'll be discussing what's next for the Straw Hats post Wano. Warning, this video will contain spoilers up to chapter 1049. You've been warned! Hello Manakama Tachi, this is Joy Girl, and now that we're at the tail end of Wano, let's discuss what the next arc has in store for the Straw Hats. I mean, in general, we can be sure that the events at Wano will have elevated the status and the perception of the Straw Hats as a crew to unparalleled heights. Not only will they have spearheaded the defeat of two of the Yonko, their captain has awakened a devil fruit so fearsome that the world government found it necessary to conceal its true name and nature from the rest of the world, plus they will have three out of the four rolled poneglyphs, plus a whole lot more standard poneglyphs which is sure to contain crucial information about the world's history and its secrets. And as physical combatants, they have really stepped it up with most of the crew taking down high-ranking Yonko officers, with some of them even gaining insane power-ups. So it's without question that the Straw Hats will be viewed by the rest of the world as a Yonko level crew. I mean, should the Yonko system even continue to exist once the defeat of Big Mom and Kaido becomes worldwide knowledge? Now, the reputation of our main characters as a collective after Wano is at the top of things that I'm personally looking forward to, but today I want to focus on a topic that goes hand in hand with this idea, and that is what can we expect from the Straw Hat members individually, both in terms of their physical abilities as well as their role in the story. So starting with Jinbei who had his first complete fight as an official member of the Straw Hats. It's no secret to either readers or in the world of One Piece what Jinbei is capable of considering his reputation. But still in terms of his future showings, Jinbei is quite unique in the sense that he doesn't have that same trajectory of growth as a fighter who will continue to evolve as he fights and trains. I mean considering his age and his experience, we've only really scratched the surface of what he's truly capable of, and so I expect that any showings of his abilities in the future will be abilities that he's already mastered as part of his arsenal, but he just hasn't had a chance to showcase them yet. What I do anticipate though is a bigger challenge for him in terms of his opponent, which we didn't quite get from Who's Who. I mean, a stronger foe, meaning that we will see Jinbei struggle a lot more and see him backed into a corner and possibly forced to showcase the true extent of his Fishman Karate. For all his strength and abilities, I don't see Jinbei becoming necessarily a highlight character in the sense that it will disrupt the monster trio dynamic, which is a whole other discussion that we have already had before. So really, what I think we will see is Jinbei have some pretty huge pivotal moments where he makes massive contributions. I mean moments which will remind us what a relief it is that we have a former 
Shichi Bukai and former captain of the Sun Pirates on our side. And really, it is very exciting to have Jinbei as a part of our crew because he obviously has so much to offer in terms of his physical capabilities as well as his tactical skills, but also, and really, his, his wisdom and his vast depth of knowledge. Actually, if we do indeed go to Elbaf in the near future, which is what a lot of us are anticipating, Jinbei could come in really handy here given his knowledge of worldly events as well as the fact that he served under Big Mom, so things that he might know because of Big Mom's connection to Elbaf. But anyways, moving on from the newest member of the crew to the oldest member of the crew, Brooke. <laughs> Get it? Okay, so the Wano arc obviously isn't over yet, and there is still some chance that this skeleton man may see some action by the end of the arc, but I do have to say that that's seeming more and more unlikely. So in that sense, Brooke has probably had the least, or at least one of the least, amounts of showings out of the Straw Hats within the Wano arc. But I do think that that's somewhat understandable given his achievements at Whole Cake Island. I mean, Brooke was essentially the MVP of the Whole Cake Island arc. But personally, I do suspect that this will more or less continue post Wano as well. I mean, I think Brooke will be used sparingly when it comes to physical combat. Don't get me wrong, I do think that Brooke will still get good fights here and there, possibly even one-on-one. -on -one. You know, fights where we see him develop some new abilities or new attacks, but I do think that these fights will remain relatively brief. On the other hand, there is some interesting potential when it comes to using his character to make way for some info drops. I mean, we can pretty much guarantee that we are going to get some heavy lore reveals in the coming arcs, and given Brook's age, some of these reveals could tie into his character in terms of his history or his past experiences. A wishful thinking of mine, but a fun, albeit wild idea, something that I would personally love to see is Brooke being able to communicate with the dead, especially because Wano talked about communicating with spirits. But in any case, on the whole, I think Brooke will more or less be a supporting character in the arcs to come. Now, Frankie, just because of where we are currently located, you know, a nation of weapons manufacturing and the origin of the Sea Stone, there is really a heck load of potential for Frankie's character. Especially after his fight with Sasaki, who was able to pierce General Frankie, I think he's going to want to focus on the durability of his armor, and in that case, Wano is really the best place for him to suit up! So I do definitely think that we will be seeing new and improved tech for Frankie, as well as some of his tinkerings for the rest of the crew. There was that dialogue from Sanji who commented that Frankie would really be interested in Queen's tech, and you know, specifically his ability to shoot laser beams over and over again. So this will most likely play out further. I mean, after all, it was laser beams, and laser beams was how Frankie was able to defeat Sasaki. So really, expanding his use of laser beams alongside fortifying his armor and his durability, possibly through sea stone, I mean, that would be great upgrades for Frankie. Also, Wino has actually been a pretty interesting and pretty surprising arc in terms of further fleshing out Frankie's character history. And I mean this in terms of Frankie's parents being pirates, as well as the fact that he had met Goldie Roger in his past. And so personally, I really do hope that Oda does expand on this little nugget here further. You know, maybe it relates to some other lore that we have yet seen revealed. But then speaking of lore, Robin. Okay, I don't know if I have ever been so excited as I was watching Robin fight Black Maria. I mean, it definitely was because it's just been so damn long since we've seen Robin's combat potential receive some focus, but boy was it needed and boy was it appreciated. But in saying that, and sad to say so, but I don't think that we will continue to see Robin receive so much highlight to her combat abilities, or at least not to this extent. I mean, I do think that we will see her involved in fights more and even use her new demonio identity, but I just don't know about her getting another major one-on-one -on -one battle like she did at Wano, or at least until we see another one-on-one -on -one battle that we can probably anticipate for when the Straw Hats go against Blackbeard 
his crew. Where Robin's character will shine, however, will most likely be related to all the lore and all the world secrets and her ability to obviously read the poneglyphs. There are now almost five poneglyphs that we have discovered from Whole Cake Island up until now to Wano. And that's not even including the road poneglyphs that we will have discovered by the end of Wano. And the craziest part is, is that we still don't know what these poneglyphs are about. But I can definitely say that we will be finding out soon. I mean, given that we are heading towards the end of the series and things are gonna get just so lore heavy, we can really expect Robin to be quite smack bang in the middle of it all. But on a more personal note relating to Robin herself, I would really love to see more of her time and more of her story with the revolutionaries. I mean, which we did see some of at Wano, but I would really like to see this expanded even further, both in terms of the lore and all the world secrets and things that she became aware of, but also if it means that we get to see more of her new combat knowledge. But Moving on, Chopper. Chopper's another straw hat that just has so much potential for further growth and development out of the straw hats. I mean, I was surprised that he didn't get so much of a combat focus at Wano, especially given the development of his monster point. But I do suppose this could be explained by the fact that he was present in the last arc. And also, managing to hold off Queen is a pretty big achievement. But now... Now that Chopper's monster point can be extended to 30 minutes, I do suspect that we will see it being used a lot more often in the future. Especially if the drawbacks means that he will continue to go into his cute baby geezer form because this could really result in some cute and comical hijinks in the future. But Chopper's character development in the post time skip era really seems to focus on his abilities as a doctor and I do believe that this will continue post Wano. I mean as we get closer to the end of the series it only makes sense that we see Chopper get closer and closer to achieving his dreams of becoming a doctor who can cure all diseases. It would be really cool if we saw Chopper cure all the victims of the defective smile devil fruits. But also, I don't know, his antidote for Queen's virus was a pretty impressive feat, so I'm just not sure how much more Oda will focus on Chopper in this arc. But I don't know, you guys can let me know whether you think Chopper will cure the defective smile devil fruit users within the Wano arc. Okay, now we have the East Blue 5. And we're also now just gonna take five seconds, we're gonna take a quick break so that you can also subscribe to this channel. Seriously, quickly before the five seconds are up. Now. All right, East Blue 5. So let's take a look at Sanji. So character arc wise, Sanji remains at the top in terms of interesting character arcs that we'll see post Wano. I mean, as always, while I'm sure that his physical abilities will be no doubt impressive, I'm really interested in his personal development in terms of how he's going to deal with his genetic augmentation. Oda's just done such a beautiful job in giving Sanji a power-up that will mean that he can keep up in terms of the growth that Zoro and Luffy have seen in this arc, but he's also stayed true to Sanji's character by giving him an internal conflict that he's going to have to work through. And I do think that Sanji has largely work through this conflict already during his fight with Queen, but I do think that we will still see Sanji deal with the repercussions of what it means to be a super soldier in the coming arcs. For one, there's the question of what is the future of the Raid Suit? I mean, because although we've obviously seen Sanji destroy the Germatech during his fight with Queen, it's not out of the question that some of the handy members of his crew, like Frankie or like Usopp, will have an idea or find a way to restore or at least recreate the suit more tailored to Sanji. Mainly because it did seem like, in Act 2 at least, that Sanji did have some plans in redesigning the suit, so maybe that will still happen. But of course, with or without the raid suit, Sanji has already proven capable of taking down a top Yonko commander, so really, mastering his newfound abilities is only natural for the continued elevation of the Straw Hat Chef. Which means... Usopp. 
Usopp was probably the straw hat with the least amount of involvement in combat in this arc with no single one-on-one -on -one victory. So because of that, there is a high potential for Usopp to receive some heavy focus in the next arc. I mean, again, many are speculating that the next arc after Wano, the next major arc after Wano will be Elbaf, in which case Usopp is sure to have a great involvement in that story. I mean, similar to how Sanji was largely absent during Dressrosa, which was then followed by the next major arc, which was heavily premised around Sanji and his past. So then in the case of Usopp, who has had a strong relationship to Elbafian giants in the past, as well as having dreams of becoming a brave warrior, the land of Elbaf is the perfect opportunity for Usopp to test his current will, you know, by being surrounded by a clan of brave warriors. And I think Oda may have sowed the seeds of this development already. I mean, especially in the more recent chapters, Usopp has been at the center of some really thought-provoking dialogue, you know, with Oda contrasting Usopp's beliefs and his values to those of the samurai when it comes to ideals of, of will, determination, honor, and life and death. So this sort of conflicting ideologies could come to a head at Elbaf and also go side by side with whatever physical developments we see from Usopp post Wano. I mean, Usopp has definitely shown some improvements in terms of his ability since the time skip, but it's obviously not to the standards of the more natural combatants of the crew. So then seeing his physical capability as well as his unique perspective about having the will to survive and seeing these develop simultaneously, I think will be a great character journey for Usopp. Now, Nami. I was actually quite surprised to see Nami get the focus that she did at Wano, considering that she was one of the members who were present throughout the Whole Cake Island arc. And as we have already established, usually those crew members who were present during Whole Cake Island just didn't get so much of a focus in the current Wano arc. But I suppose that she did play largely a supporting role at Whole Cake Island, as well as just, you know, reflecting the general sentiments of fans, really, as we were reacting to the drama between Luffy and Sanji unfold, at least in the beginning of the arc. So in that sense, it really is great, and it sure was welcome to see Nami get some further character development for herself at Wano, as well as of course some unexpected but very welcome action moments. And now that she has this awesome power up in the form of Zeus, she's really well situated to continue to grow her abilities as a physical combatant. I mean sure this won't change the dynamics within the crew, but it will no doubt mean that on the whole, we will feel more confident about the Straw Hats going on to face bigger and badder foes. Which then brings us to the big bad Zoro. I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps most intriguing out of the bunch in terms of future story reveals, Zoro was seen quite literally facing death the last time he was awake or the last time that he was conscious shortly after awakening Conqueror's Haki. So a deeper look into that scene is something that I am expecting from Zoro's story. I am also still expecting to see more being divulged about his connection to the Shimotskis, you know, before we leave Wano, but honestly, I don't think that it's something that Zoro himself is going to dwell on much, or at least on a personal level anyways. What I do expect to see, however, is his continued struggle with Enmar and obviously with his Conqueror's Haki. I mean, it's quite obvious that Oda is setting us up for this. Even Kaido's comment that Haki is what is most important in conquering the world, that piece of dialogue opens up a lot of potential for Zoro as a non-Devil Fruit user. Personally, I also still maintain that Zoro will leave Wano with the Nidai Kitetsu and that he'll leave his Sandai Kitetsu behind. But most importantly, I think we're all anticipating for Zoro to take the next step and finally turn his swords into a black blade. The more interesting question, however, is 
Which of his swords will be turned first? From a more sentimental standpoint, I'd personally like to see the Wado Ichimonji get turned into a Black Blade first, but the focus does definitely seem to be Zoro's control of Enma, including the full potential of Enma should Zoro succeed in turning Enma into a Black Blade, which could then mean that the Wado Ichimonji is possibly the last sword of his that he will manage to turn into a Black Blade, thereby, you know, bringing his story full circle. You know, if this happens towards the end of his story, considering it was the biggest part of his journey. Zoro is obviously a character that we have all been waiting for some further dive into his backstory, and I do think that there are definitely still some left to be explored before we leave Wano, and maybe this will have some bearing as we continue with the rest of the series alongside his development of obviously becoming the strongest swordsman of the world. Which then brings us to our Captain Luffy. The sky is really the limit when it comes to Luffy. I mean, our rubber boy, or I suppose it's the most ridiculous boy or even our sun god boy, he's just reached such an insane level that I don't even know where to begin in terms of what I expect from him post Wano. But I suppose that first of all, there is that interesting question of when or even if he will find out that his devil fruit is not actually the Gomu Gomu no Mi and is indeed something much more powerful. And so I suppose if we do indeed go to Elbaf and the red hair pirates are there, especially if Shanks is there, then this obviously presents the prime opportunity for Luffy to become more aware of his devil fruit powers and the true nature and the implications of his abilities. But given how ridiculous Luffy's devil fruit powers are, I'm really intrigued as to how Oda is going to maintain Luffy's underdog status, you know, especially after defeating Kaido. I suppose when it comes to figures like Im, there is the element of surprise because we just don't know anything about Im yet. And I suppose there's also the SSG unit that the world government have up their sleeves. And when it comes to Blackbeard, well, I suppose Blackbeard will have the element of potentially having three devil fruits, especially as we've consistently seen Blackbeard Blackbeard progressively developing alongside Luffy as the series progresses. So the threat of Blackbeard actually having three devil fruits by the time that he and Luffy cross paths, that does make for a really interesting setup in terms of a battle. You know, three devil fruits versus one insane devil fruit. Actually on that note, going back to Kaido's comment about Haki, I actually think that Luffy will prove that it's going to be his combination of devil fruit and Haki and how to maximize this combo to his advantage, which is something that we may see used against Blackbeard, given that Blackbeard's character has been more closely tied to Devil Fruit abilities. But overall, it is clear that the Straw Hats are reaching levels that we could only dream of when we first started the series. I mean, even the growth from the beginning of Wano to what we see now is truly insane. So I really do wonder what sort of wild situations they're going to find themselves in following Wano. I mean, especially after the defeat of Tu Yonko, as well as Luffy awakening his devil fruit, I really highly doubt that the world government are just going to sit idly by. So I really think that we're going to see some really interesting things play out, especially with the different factions within the world government coming to a head, which is something that was hinted at at Wano, while on a more broader scale, we'll also see the revolutionaries as well as the Blackbeard pirates all coming to take a bite of the action. And then of course, the Straw Hats will be caught in the smack bang center of it all. But hey, at least the prospects of seeing their ever increasing development and their strength as a crew has me ready to see them, you know, in the middle of all this trouble. Anyways, those are my thoughts on what I expect to see from the Straw Hats post Wano. I'd love to hear your thoughts so please let me know by leaving a comment below don't forget to like and share the video please do subscribe if you haven't already you can also join our joy fleet discord server or even become a patron member and i do want to thank all our patrons for help supporting the channel this is joy girl and i'll see you again soon